first, thank you all for coming on this beautiful day to the UAA Campus Bookstore. I'm Rachel Epstein, the events coordinator here. And um, after um, our guest speaker talks, we'll have time for a Q&A and a discussion. Okay, so please think of lots of good questions for him. It's a great opportunity to learn a lot right now. Um, right now, I'd like to welcome Ameda DeWitt Schleif, excuse me, Schleifman, who is going to introduce um, our guest speaker. Um, Ameda? Le Kara Klenach, Mira Duet Schleifman, Juchat Dua Sak, Schlinget Klenach, Zetzi Nak, Juchat Dua Sak, Nanyaina Hatsati, Kachari Yari Hatsati, Stakin Kwan Ayahat. Basic translation is Hi, I'm Mida. <laughs> so we are actually very blessed today. We have our guest, Dr. Chris Cavlin, who's traveled from Australia to Turtle Island via Lower 48 and through Canada. And he is now here with us in Alaska. And he is speaking in regards to traditional healing and the different activities that are going on around the world. Um, there are some exciting um, activities that are happening in indigenous communities who are in the process of reclaiming what was what is rightfully theirs. And so I'm full, my heart is full that he is here. And so I'm gonna let him introduce all of his credentials because I know that I'll make a mess of them. And um, I'd like to invite, if everybody would invite Dr. Kavlin up to this symposium. Thank you. Uh, it really is a, a blessing to be here. I'm really so grateful. Um, uh, I love Alaska very much. I've been here a few times, and uh, each time my heart has felt like I really want to be of service to this land, and the people that I meet are also loving and generous. And uh, so I want to honor the custodians of this land, and I want to honor the elders that are present, and uh, honor the ancestors of this land, and the ancestors of the land that I come from. And uh, I know that there is an exchange of gifts between our ancestors and the opportunity for learning and healing of, of old wounds. So I'm very grateful for that and for our ancestors that are present. Uh, I'd like to uh, have your permission to sing a prayer to begin with, if that's okay with everyone. Okay. Oh God! and the powerful. Thank you. Um, yeah, so there's lots of things that we could talk about. I'll try and go for about an hour. I think I'll skip the credentials part of thing. Um, I was born in New York City in Manhattan. Uh, it looks really good on my passport, but uh, this is where my mother worked in the hospital there. And uh, I grew up in northern New Jersey near the Jackson White community, which uh, is an abandoned mine, which has uh, escaped African slaves, sympathetic whites, and Native Americans that all mixed together as one community. Um, and uh, I grew up in that social situation for the first five years of my life. And um, I was blessed to have a father who was a psychologist that loved uh, his Native American friends. And we lived on different Native reservations. Uh, and the last place that I lived before I went to Australia was the Wind River Indian Reservation in Wyoming, 
which is Shoshone and Arapaho tribes. Uh, I left there and I've lived in Australia and New Zealand for about 26 years now and uh, have been blessed to have friendships uh, in the Aboriginal and Maori communities in the Pacific Islands where the same kinds of love and intimacy for land and the spiritual realm and ancestral uh, respect are part of those cultures so it made me feel like I was at home. Um, you know I, I just because I had the blessing of having friendships and and living uh, among uh, Native Americans and indigenous peoples doesn't give me any specific uh, privileged uh, wisdom but I while I was uh, growing up there you know I remember walking through the mountains in Wyoming with the son of uh, a Shoshone medicine man uh, who is my dad's best friend and I remember he was introducing the mountains to me and he was pointing to uh, plants and animals you know and he was saying there is courage, there is sacrifice, uh, there is patience, there is nobility. And, you know, I remember while we were walking, saying, I can't see these spiritual qualities that he's speaking about, you know. After he named them and described them, I had some kind of feeling. But prior to him naming them, I, that's not what I was seeing, you know. And so I remember that really gave me a strong sense of my own blindness, you know, of my own inability to perceive the spiritual intrinsic value, as they say in philosophy, of nature, that each created thing has its own uh, unique reflection of a, a name of the creator, some might say, or that each plant or animal has its own gift that it gives to the world, besides its outward appearance. And so, this really made me question, like, what is necessary for me to repair this blindness in myself? And uh, it begins with uh, humility. You know, I remember sitting with the father of my friend, who my, my, my own father really talked him up. You know, he said, this man is, uh, you know, a really great healer. And he has such spiritual sensitivity that if he knows somebody on the other side of the country and he is inspired in prayer, that he should travel to help that person. He'll drive for days to a stranger, you know, go into a post office where he knows that person's in line and just stand next to them and say a prayer and briefly touch them on the shoulder and then drive all the way back home three days away, you know. So I remember as a young man thinking, wow, what kind of spiritual, you know, insight and connection and, and uh, you know, vision that you must have to, to be able to heal like that. And and I remember my first conversation with him, you know, we were trying to, sp trying to speak together, I was trying to speak. And uh, after a very short time, he said, I can't speak with you. And I was like, what? He says, well, you're talking with your head, not your heart, and I can't speak with you. And he just left the room, and I was just like looking around going, whoa, wait a minute, I heard so much about you, you know, and you just left the room. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that was the first introduction into to that I, I have some ways to go in uh, being able to see and speak from my own heart. And, uh, you know, that was more than 25 years ago, so I hope I've come a little way. And, uh, you know, the last time that I saw him, uh, my father had passed away a few years before, so he really, we had some really wonderful conversations where he shared some things about my father that I, that I hadn't known about. And, uh, you know, my father had lived on the reservation for a number of years and I knew he loved the land and he loved his friends and he loved the, the culture and, uh, and I knew he left the reservation and I wasn't sure why but uh, when I was sitting with his best friend only three years ago or four years ago now uh, you know he let me know that my father who was a psychologist in the health system there found that there was an injustice happening in the health system and uh, he sat with his uh, best friend and said, you know, I know that if I report this injustice that my life will change. And uh, I'm not sure, you know. So he went for a walk in the mountains and he said some prayers, a long walk. And when he came back, he had decided, yes, I, I have to report this. So he did report it and 
the government uh, couldn't fire him because you know he hadn't done anything technically illegal, but he had blown the whistle on this injustice in the health system, and uh, he was removed from the reservation. That's how they could punish him. So they took him off. My father never told me that story. It was only someone else that was able to share that with me. So just want to honor my father. for having given me uh, you know, this love for justice. So when I was, uh, you know, I never planned on doing a PhD in law. Uh, when I was doing my master's, which was focusing on the environmental crisis, you know, and I was looking at that same issue of blindness in myself and in Western society, like how do we not see the spiritual value of each created thing? How is it that we only look at the economic value of what we can get from each thing and how does that affect the the environmental crisis that we have is really due to our not being in love you know we're not in love with nature you know that created us that we evolved through however you want to say it it's our family and we don't have that intimacy in the urban hyper separation that in cities you know we live in the big cities and we don't feel that intimacy so, you know, I was doing my master's, looking at how do you resolve this, how do you heal this. And in the last chapter, I was wanting to focus on what are the practical applications in law and policy if we do value the spiritual value of nature. And while I was doing the research on that chapter, I discovered that majority of the world's medicines come from indigenous peoples. At that point, the reference was 77% of all plant-related medicines or pharmaceuticals. You know, and I later found out it was much higher than that, and through my own uh, primary research. But you know, having grown up in with my friendships uh, as they were, it gave me a, a stronger sense of injustice, perhaps than um, you know might not have been otherwise. And so I, at the same time, found out that the Australian government was seeking to create a national program uh, called facilitating the buyer prospecting industry. Uh, and they were inviting parliamentary submissions into their plan. And the way they advertised it was very specialized language, and I knew nobody was going to respond to this. It was a very small section of the newspaper. And so I started calling law schools to ask, you know, what, what are people doing about the protection of the medicines? <coughs> And uh, it was very silent on the end of the other end of the phone each time. And uh, finally, I found somebody who knew something about it. And they said that they were doing both native title and environmental law, and so there was some overlap. And I went to see them and realized by the end of the day that the conversation she thought was uh, something different. I was wanting to ask some questions for the finalizing my master's thesis. and. I went along for the ride, and by the end of the day, I was staring at an ID card saying I was doing a PhD in law, and I hadn't finished my master's yet. <laughs> so within a week, uh, I bumped into somebody on the stairway, and uh, after I just finished saying some prayers, begging for the PhD to be of practical use rather than just words, and, uh, and somebody bumped into me on the stairway, and it was a lecturer who teaches intellectual property law. And she looked at me and she said, oh, you're that new PhD student. You're doing protection of indigenous medicines? I said, yeah. And uh, mind you, I had not done any law at this stage. It was only one week. <laughs> and she said, oh, that's, uh, that involves intellectual property law, doesn't it? And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it does. And uh, <laughs> I just actually I had an intellectual property law textbook on my desk, uh, which I had just opened that morning. And she saw it on my desk, and she said, OK, well, would you help me by uh, taking over? Because somebody dropped out, and I need a new lecture in intellectual property law. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I found myself saying yes, because I realized I'd said some prayers, and I better pay attention. So uh, the, you know, it was very, I remember feeling quite nauseous. <laughs> it, was, it was year four and five law students. You know, They had already done four or five years of law, and I had done nothing. And I was supposed to be teaching them intellectual property law, which is a year four law subject at the Macquarie University. And uh, you know, so the only way I could do it was to read the book one week ahead of them. Uh, <laughs> hadn't even read the whole book yet, you know. <laughs> so I just read one week ahead of them. And you know, the, the, the human mm, tendency to trust knowledge for somebody that stands behind a podium 
kicked in, just like it probably does for you guys right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so I was able to bluff my way through with just uh, paying attention to that one week of material each time and praying to God nobody asked a difficult question. Um, but after, you know, after three or four years, it became fairly, you know, a lot easier. But, uh, you know, I think the reason why I was blessed with that situation of being pushed into teaching law so swiftly was because it gave me, you know, the Creator wanted me to learn quickly how irrelevant Western intellectual property law is for protecting indigenous medical knowledge. So I wouldn't waste my time trying to do CPR on a corpse, putting it strongly, uh, or tweak, make a new sui generis system, as they call it in law, you know, a new, a new type of Western intellectual property law. So, so I turned my attention to the fact that, you know, indigenous communities around the world, they already have their own indigenous customary laws. Each community has their, their lore, their traditions, their spiritual practices, ceremonies that honor and protect and transmit the knowledge of those medicines. And so finding ways to honor the diversity of those systems because one, each community seemed to have differences, but one universal was that only the people of that land can speak for that land, you know? So when you think about it, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, if, if you've been living in a place for a long time and your ancestors, generations after generations, have been there, it's not just about how much you've learned and how much you know about that place, but you're in love, you know? There's a love there that is hard-earned, long time. And that love gives you a right to speak, just like somebody you're in love with, you know? If you're in love with somebody, a human being, nobody else has the right to speak on their behalf, you know? I wouldn't want someone to automatically assume just because they spent a week knowing my wife that they had the right to speak on her behalf or say they know her completely in, in ways that I don't, you know? And that love enables you to see when it's not healthy. When the person you love isn't healthy, there's the smallest difference you notice straight away, you know? It's a very powerful thing, that kind of intimacy. And so it really needs to be honored, you know? It's a very gentle thing. It's also very powerful and it needs to be respected. So the laws and the customs and the ceremonies and the song and the dance and the art, these are ways of celebrating that love. And they have meaning beyond what we think we can see, more than just the outward appearance of things. So, you know, when I started doing my PhD, one of the first things that I learned was that in the history of colonization, that when the ships came from England and you know, the other European countries to Alaska and Canada and the lower 48 and to Australia and New Zealand and other countries, and there was something that was universal. They all had their own medicines and all medicine was plant-based back then. And they had their plants from Europe for specific diseases, toxins. And when they came here, they found, oh, there's different things. There's different diseases, there's different illnesses, and they didn't know what to do. Now, of course, medicine being a gift from the Creator healer saw someone sick, and they said the role of this medicine is to heal this person, and they freely offered to heal the people when they came over. And so they healed people, and they shared with them what they knew. And so colonists had these two problems, the new diseases and a supply chain issue, because if you've got a ship it takes a really long time to cross the ocean and it sinks and that was your that was your medicines for the for the year well what do you do so now you have to find alternatives for the medicines that you did have so you need to now also ask for help with that so that led to the first pharmacopoeia in the United States the official list of all the medicines for the, from the government first official pharmacopoeia being listed as more than half Native American, explicitly naming these came from Native American communities. And it wasn't until the late 1800s that the German uh, invention of being able to uh, create chemical compounds in factories and mass produce these compounds 
combined with corporate recognition that this would create an ability to commercialize medicine in a global way because you could put things into pills rather than having to preserve plants, you know? And so you're putting these plants, these compounds that have now been processed in factories into pills, but they still come from the plants. And then they develop a patent system to protect the monopolies or the rights to sell that medicine to just that company. And so by the turn of the century, we have a different situation where the next pharmacopoeia to come out, none of the medicines have come from Native Americans as far as it's showing. So they're all coming from companies now. But of course, they just de-identified the ones that came from the communities. So we grew up, when we go to the drugstore, with this common cultural sense that it just comes from a laboratory or, or some kind of you know, lab coat scenario in, a, in some kind of laboratory, produces these medicines. Not recognizing that this, the synthesizing of those compounds actually comes from the plants. And so this cuts off our capacity, the spiritual capacity for gratitude and reciprocity, which is really the greatest harm in the Western health system. So we no longer have the ability to say, my grandmother was healed. You know, my grandmother was healed but from breast cancer and somebody gave her Taxol. You know, and this comes after a long period of tracing it. I spoke to the widow of the person that gathered it. The National Cancer Institute officially says it was randomly collected. But I found out that the man that collected the sample in nature was actually trained by an ethnobotanist and that was his methodology. And I got his PhD and he has photos of the trees with Native Americans standing next to the trees for perspective. Doesn't even name them, just shows how tall the tree is. <laughs> you know. And in the beginning of his PhD he says, indigenous peoples have a wealth of medical knowledge but I'm not here to discuss that in this thesis because I'm just a chemist. I'm going to talk about the chemical aspects. So there's this process of not expressing, not honoring gratitude, not honoring the origins from the plants themselves or the ancestors. But that cancer medicine that healed my grandmother comes from the Pacific yew tree, you know? And there's a number of coastal communities in Alaska and down through British Columbia that use that, you know? And when I looked for the different uses, you know, I saw that the Simshian were using the Pacific yew for different types of cancer treatment. So, you know, honoring when our family members are healed or ourselves are healed, you know, I had to stay, say to myself at the beginning of my PhD, this wasn't about me trying to say here's a new solution, I had to start with myself. Where's my own accountability? Where's my blindness? So why am I not asking where my medicines come from? How come I've never asked that ever in my life? You know, I'm accountable for that. I didn't ask. And so when I started asking, they just started coming out. The medicines came out to meet me. And, uh, you know, if I was in an academic forum, I would talk about the tools that I've developed for tracing the pharmaceutical drugs back to the communities. Really, it's just prayer, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> you know, I just uh, express gratitude, and uh, it gives a certain kind of vision. The more times you practice gratitude, you start to notice, you know. Gratitude creates vision, you know. So you know, I started noticing gaps in when there would be a gap in a story. It would set off a warning bell for me. So I started tracing HIV medicines and, uh, you know, I, um, what was the first? The first HIV medicine was in a Samoa, is a prostratin. And, uh, you know, that's, Something that was still in clinical trials, I'm not sure how that's proceeding. That may or may not work out, but it's, uh, it, was a, it was a drug that's used for treating hepatitis. And uh, that's the way they do it, because most indigenous communities don't have HIV medicines because it's a new, new disease, right? But hep hepatitis and HIV, if you find a drug for HIV, there's a good chance it's going to work against uh, 
hepatitis, it'll work against HIV. So they look for hepatitis drugs. And so in Samoa, this case, uh, that's how they discovered this, you know, because it was very effective against hepatitis, uh, called the mamala plant. And that's public knowledge, otherwise I wouldn't say it. Um, and then the next one was in Western Australia. It's called the smoke bush. And it's a, a bush used by the Noongar people of Western Australia from Perth to Esperance. And it's a bush that the elders use, people use for treating uh, old person's disease, like Alzheimer's and these kinds of things. And somebody uh, came from the National Cancer Institute and actually tried to uh, take a sample out of the country, which was against the law. Like, you know, that's why they search you and stuff at airports, you know. And he got caught, and he actually got arrested. <laughs> um, but uh, so they started to develop it in AMRAD Pharmaceuticals in Australia. And they said, oh, it's the compound's too clunky. It's, it's toxic. It's not, we can't make it. Uh, safe for, for the human um, to uh, be able to process. And, uh, and so the, they basically said, we're not going to research this anymore. And so people kind of heard about it and they let go of it. And then I found out that the National Cancer Institute and the University of Chicago and a couple of other, other institutions had gone ahead and taken this back up a number of years ago and uh, were proceeding with it. You know, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, why another reason you want to practice gratitude and honor and ask for permission is if you're going to waste years on trying to develop a medicine from a plant without consulting the traditional healers that pass that knowledge on, whether in, with consent or not, and you're finding out that it's toxic to the human system, maybe it's worth having a conversation, you know? Maybe it's worth finding out that it works if you inhale it, but it doesn't work if you try to make it into a pill. But nobody's had that conversation, you know? So if it doesn't work as an HIV medicine, it's not necessarily because it wasn't a good medicine for it. It's because there wasn't any humility. <laughs> now, you know, the same thing is true for, well, I'll tell you, I, these two drugs, the Western Australian smoke bush for Aboriginal people, and the mamala plant from Samoa, prostratin and concrevo in these two compounds. I went to the HIV conference last August with the intention of meeting with community members from those communities to let them know. Because you go into the HIV conference, you know, there's thousands of people, and all of the literature around indigenous peoples says, you know, they need more education. They're more at risk of contracting HIV. They're more susceptible. This is the kind of mantra that you hear in relation to indigenous peoples and health. There's no, our health systems are dependent on them. You don't get that. You don't get our medicines came from them. And so when I went and found people from those communities and shared the stories of where these two HIV medicines came from, it was very powerful, you know. There were tears, there was shock, good shock, you know. I can't wait to tell my children so they can feel proud. So, you know, <clears throat> while I was there, I was wanting to talk to the World Health Organization because even though historically, you know, in the past, uh, most of the medicines, pharmaceutical medicines, have come from indigenous peoples, even in the current age, you know, 10 years ago, the World Health Organization did a study and they did a global atlas of traditional healing. And they found that 80% of the world's health is provided by traditional healers now, at this time, 80%. And yet none of the policy, none of the government policy, none of the funding goes towards the support of that 80% of our health being provided by traditional healers in this day and age in developed countries, and even in developing countries and remote areas, the indigenous people turn towards their traditional healers, who tend to have to go underground because of what happened with the colonists that came in and said that's black magic and these kinds of things. So people didn't feel comfortable anymore to be public. They're still there. I went to Samoa, and I was in a village where we had a gathering of traditional healers. 
was only a village of about 1,500 people, and 30 aunties showed up. And, and some of them said, I didn't know you were a healer. She goes, yeah. Because <laughs> they all have their other jobs as well, you know, the other things they do in the community. She says, yeah, my grandma, she taught me how to work on shoulders. She says, yeah, my grandmother, she showed me how to treat cataracts. Or I work on teeth, you know. Some of them are all known. Some of those healers are known, but some weren't. Even in a small village, they might not know each other. So creating those sharing circles for traditional healers in a safe space is a really powerful way of revival. Because I, in the very first gathering, I said, I wasn't sure if this is going to be meaningful for people. You know, I didn't know. I said, speak in your own language. Don't even translate for me. It's just about you sharing with each other. And afterwards, I asked them, because I saw some of them were quite moved. And they shared with me that two things that happened. One is one woman who had been given knowledge of how to use a medicinal plant by her mother but couldn't because she said the plant had gone into hiding. She couldn't find it anymore. Another woman, she had that plant in her garden. She had kept it alive. But she had a different way to use it. So what happened? The plant comes back to life. It comes out of hiding. She shares her plant cuttings with her, and then she teaches her the other way to use it for medicine. So the knowledge and the plant comes back to life through the sharing circles. It's a very powerful, simple thing. It's probably the most powerful way for reviving and protecting the knowledge. That's that simple way, bringing the grandmothers together, not having any agenda of university recording and publication. Forget that. Not having any agenda of the government to regulate it. Not having any agenda of the corporate to try to commercialize. Just a safe space for them to share. My university didn't like me. <laughs> so they gave me money and I just created the, these spaces without giving them anything in return for the money. So it didn't last very long as a project. <laughs> but it was really valuable for, for learning, you know. And, um, you know, so I'm at this conference, back to the, you know, at this conference, and I uh, recognize the World Health Organization has said 80% of the world's health in developing countries and remote areas in developed countries provided by traditional healers. And I said, well, if this is a fact, if they're, if they're endorsing this, then they really should be putting their money where their mouth is. Because all the money is going towards the 20% Western health system, which has all kinds of problems in itself. And the money that is going to programs with traditional healers is going towards how to integrate them into the Western system, not about supporting their living knowledge systems. So. I thought, okay, I'll go talk to the World Health Organization and see what I can do for getting support. Now, they were in a different part of the conference. It cost like $1,000 a day, and I didn't have the money to do that. So I was in the global village part where all the indigenous people were, <laughs> where it's free. And, uh, and I found a, a organization, a partner organization of the World Health Organization. You know, and I said, uh, I started to talk to this man. He had a really lovely silk tie. And, and uh, his, his organization works on education on HIV. And I wanted to suggest a very small practical step of producing children's books that honor where the medicines come from for Western Australia. We'll just with that, start with that one community to say, your grandparents, your ancestors had this wisdom, this healing knowledge that has meant that the world has this medicine. It's just a children's book, you know, and I, before I could even get the words out, I spoke like two sentences and he went, oh, no, 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 no. We don't work with herbal medicines. We only work with synthesized compounds, you know. And I was like, kind of, she didn't even let me try and get it over the line, you know. So I said, no, no, no. He says, you do. He goes, no, 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 we don't. It's kind of like kids in school, you know. <laughs> and I said, no, you do. I said, because those synthesized compounds come from herbal remedies that are then synthesized in the laboratory. And he said, no, 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 they don't. And then I named Concrevone and Prostrat. And he goes, yeah, yeah, OK, those. But none of the cocktail itself. And I was like, yes, it does. I was bluffing. I didn't know. <laughs> I was bluffing. And I said, no, no, it does. And he goes, he goes no, no, OK, just the one. And I was like, <laughs> I didn't know that yet. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, just, I mean, we don't really use it anymore, you know, AZT. I was like, what, AZT? That's like the main HIV medicine for the first part of the epidemic. And I know there's problems with toxicity with that, but 
He said, yeah, you know. And I, so I didn't say anything. I didn't say, oh, I didn't know that. I just backed away slowly and went home <laughs> and started researching AZT and found it comes from the herring. And the last time I was in Alaska, the last thing I was given was a plate of herring eggs. You know, and I was due to speak at the conference here last year. I had one week to go until I was going to speak through Skype to this gathering, you know. So one week before, and I find out that the herring is the source of HIV medicine for us. And I wonder if they had those conversation, conversations with the traditional healers, would it have been so toxic? You know? Aren't there ways that it's used? Do people have toxic reactions when they're gathering the, the herring eggs? You know? No. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so this was a miracle. You know, this is uh, discovering this, you know? And, um, you know, and so since then, uh, discovered another, I can't really talk about it in too much depth because I, I haven't gotten permission from uh, this particular healer to speak about some of the specific nature of the story. But I can say that uh, there's a, a HIV medicine which won the Nobel Prize, which comes from an indigenous medicine. And uh, it's called Indinavar. That's the Western name for it, Indi Indinavar, <laughs> Indinavar. <laughs> and it's on the World Health, list, uh, World, World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. And so, so you know, honoring those, uh, those are just a few that I've just bothered even looking at, you know. And every single university in the world at the moment has research programs where you know, this is not some historical thing. They're, they're researching indigenous medicines all over the world. And that's okay if it's done with respect and practicing gratitude and getting consent and having a permission and having a working relationship. You know, I set up a, I tried to stop some scientists in my university, um, in Macquarie University in Australia. When I just had started my PhD, and uh, I found out that uh, there was a group of scientists in my own university researching indigenous medicines. And I was like, wow, it's not like out there somewhere. It's right here where I am as a student. And I was really shocked. And I talked to Terry Witters, who was the only Aboriginal uh, teacher at the university. And he was my supervisor. And uh, you know, I, was, I said to him, look, you know, uh, I don't, it doesn't matter if the scientists are trustworthy. That's actually not what it's about. I mean, it's, they have to be trustworthy. But even if they're trustworthy, the system isn't trustworthy at the moment. And so, you know, what do I do? And he said, well, you just have to ask them to, to stop what they're doing. And I was like, I'm like just a first year student in law. Am I going to go to these professors and ask them to stop? And he said, yeah. So I contacted them and I said, you know, uh, my name's Chris Cavalin. And they went, oh, Chris. It's like, what? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, you know, we've uh, been wanting to get together with you. We actually put you in a poster of ours uh, at, a, at a conference. I'm like, what? And they said, yeah. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, yeah, we're doing this. You know, I said, yeah, I heard you're, you're getting medicines from this community. And he said, yeah, we put you in the poster. And I said, well, can you take me out? And, uh, you know, and I said, well, I want to have a meeting with you. And they kind of ignored the poster taking out part. But they said, yeah, we'd love to have a meeting. And I said, well, you know, at the meeting, I said to them, it's actually not about your trustworthiness. It doesn't matter how good you do things. At the moment, the corporate and legal situation is if you make a big discovery and you publish it, it's probably going to get taken, you know, and, uh, and utilized uh, by somebody else for their own profit, which doesn't make the medicine go away, but it's, it's not a good thing, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, I talked to them about what trustworthy, trustworthiness looks like, and I said, they said, well, that's okay because, you know, that's what you're here for. The reason why we included you the poster is because you're the only person in the country doing a PhD in law on the protection of indigenous medical knowledge, and so you'll protect it. And I'm like, no, no, I said, no, that's, the whole point is, is you can't protect it right now. And, uh, and like, they just kind of ignored me, and I said, look, what I can do is um, you guys put a hold on this research, and I'll organize a workshop, and I'll invite Aboriginal lawyers 
community elders that have had experiences of appropriation, and we can all get together and consult about possible solutions. And if we develop a solution out of that, then we can perhaps proceed. You know, but let's do that first. And they said, oh, we love workshops. <laughs> you know, so they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but come, come and, uh, ha to a meeting with us next week. Uh, we're applying for half a million dollars more to do this. And I was like, Did they didn't hear me? What's going on here? So anyway, uh, I went to the meeting. And uh, at one point, the deputy vice chancellor was, you know, he was kind of, it was, the grant was for an innovative, uh, vice chancellor innovative grant. So they have to develop an innovative model of research that's unique so that other people will come to this university because they've got a new model of research. And the scientists were trying to argue that developing a new cancer medicine would be innovative. And he said, no, but there's a lot of universities trying to do the same kind of thing. It's not innovative in itself. You know, and he was, mm, and you could see his body language was moving towards no. And the scientists were kind of uh, panicking, maybe. And so then somebody turned it over to me, and I had made it clear that I was only going to be there as an observer, and that I wasn't actually part of the group. They turned it over to me, and I was like, wait a minute, why have they turned this over to me? Like, I was coming here to ask them to stop. So, so when I spoke, I, I, you know, I, before I spoke, like, the room had frozen, and I said, if I say this, this will happen. If I say this, this will happen. It was really, like, it hasn't happened like that before for me, where time stopped, and I thought about the implications of each kind of thing that I might say. And when the room clicked into motion, I found myself saying, if you want to be famous as a university, because that's the purpose of an innovative research grant, you want to be famous for something. Be famous for being the first university to be trustworthy. Because if you develop a medicine and it gets appropriated, those communities, they're going to know about that. And they have an oral network, and they'll tell the other communities, and they're not going to work with you anymore. I said, but if you're trustworthy and you turn ownership of the whole project over to the indigenous community and allow them to be in control of the research, that's trustworthy. Allow them to say what they want to happen. We do that with corporations. We form industry partners where the, in, where the industry is allowed to say, we want the research to produce these outcomes. This is how we want you to do it. But we don't do the same thing with indigenous communities. So I said, why don't we apply that same kind of control of the research process? So nobody's ever talked about regionally based indigenous owned pharmaceutical companies that have spiritual principles as the basis. You know, that's pretty unique. If they want something like that, we could support them, you know. But let's consult with them and let them decide. So he's, he's, he stopped and he said, yeah, well, I won't give you guys 100, 500,000 for that research, but he said, I'll give you 100,000 to develop that. We walked out and I was like, I was a student. I had my bicycle leaning against the wall. Got on, ding, ding. <laughs> I was going to say, okay, see you guys later. I'm off to a lecture. I didn't even know what had happened in there, actually. And they were kind of stunned, and they were looking around, and they go, what just happened in there? And I said, well, I'll see you guys later. He said, come back. I said, what? He says, you have to write a grant. So we're scientists. This is about ethics and law. This isn't about science. And I said, what? I don't know. I don't even know what a grant is. <laughs> and they said, yeah, well, you have to write this grant. So I went, in, I went to my office, and I Googled how to write a grant. <laughs> That's actually what I put in. And I was, like, downloading all these how do you write a grant guides and I was totally lost in it. I was going, this is horrible. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do here. And so that was actually a good thing because, you know, I had to own my own ignorance. You know, I had to say, I don't know how. I don't know what a good model looks like. I don't know what good research looks like. It turned out to be a good thing because I ended up writing a research grant that said we have to practice humility and we have to have collaboration where we have invite them to the university and then we go to their community, and together we consult, and the communities decide how they want the research to look. So the first grant actually has to be about, the 100,000 has to go towards what are the questions we even want to ask. You can't make the question yet, because that will determine the cultural values. You have to let the community decide what the questions are going to be. And so we did that. And the community, we met with them, I remember the first time, and they were kind of like sitting back. 
you know, and they were a little bit dubious, you know. There were some relationships there already, so it wasn't completely rejection, but they were kind of like, ooh, what's this? You know, and I got up and gave my spiel about regionally based spiritual foundations of pharmaceutical companies, and they're kind of like, <laughs> you know, and my friend John Hunter, who's Aboriginal, he got up and spoke, and, you know, together I think we kind of swayed them, which I'm not too sure if that was a good thing or not in hindsight, to be honest with you, because, you know, it maybe established trust when trust wasn't necessarily earned yet, you know. But one beautiful thing from that was the elders said, you know, we don't really want this pharmaceutical company thing, you know. We actually, you know, we've got in our high schools, there's a lot of racism. And the principal's trying to get our students out bef by, the t by the first legal age that's allowed. And they're trying to push them out. You know, we'd like you to talk to the principal <laughs> as professors, you know. We, and, and our elders are passing away. We'd like you to sit down and record their stories and help the youth collaborate in that recording so that, that those stories can live on for our youth. You know, and we don't actually have any scientists in our community. None of our students go on to university. We'd love some support for that. So that shifted the whole research project around from where my heart's desire was. <laughs> you know, and uh, they started to uh, focus on that. And they established scholarships for the youth uh, to come into the university. And they showed how their medicines killed the bacteria better than industry standard antibiotics. They killed it faster in a bigger circle in the Petri dish. And these kids are going, wow, that's our medicine. You know, and they got inspired and started coming to university over the next couple of years. You know, and it won some big national award. I got made a little bit invisible in the process because I was just a student. You know, you don't, students don't tend to own these kinds of grants and things. But it was a beautiful thing to watch. So, yeah. So anyway, that's one story. But I just want to say that, um, you know, I think humility is really important. No matter what the research or, or whatever the relationship, uh, we have to start with humility and accept, like for myself, I have to accept I have a subconscious sense of superiority, right? And I know that because quite often when I was younger, I would catch myself waiting for somebody to finish speaking because I had something to say. You know, that's arrogance. That's a subconscious sense of superiority. Whether it's racism or what, I don't know, but I mean, it's. I, I had that with every color. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, at times I think I'm smarter than other people, you know, and I have to be careful about that because then that's dangerous, you know. So, yeah. Now, um, now another kind of medicine, uh, I want to share one more story. I uh, can't even see the clock. How much time have I been speaking here? We have plenty of time. We have another whole other hour and 10 minutes. Okay. Well, I'll finish off with a story and then we can do questions. So, you know, I haven't really talked about the spiritual dimension much of the medicines. So, you know, I've had some experiences, particularly over like since 2004, where I've started to appreciate it's not just about the compounds, it's not just about the plants, but there's a spiritual dimension involved to this. And that prayer is a, is a really big part of, of the ways that these medicines are discovered, right? Prayerful ceremony, our ancestors guide us to understand the medicines, and we meet medicines that way. And, um, you know, and I've, I spoke with an elder uh, by the name of Auntie Marianne Coconut, and she's the senior elder of the Twal Eagles Council up in Weepa, you know. And I was starting to teach a course called Spirituality and Social Transformation, which I've been teaching for about 11 years now at Macquarie University. And, I bring together students of all different faiths and cultures, and it's a safe space to learn how to honor each other's you know, strengths, cultural strengths and spiritual gifts in a way that doesn't have one religion kind of presupposing dominance and just being able to learn from each other. And I was asked to develop this, and I was, again, like, how, how am I going to do this? Like, I can't believe I've been asked to do this in a university. And so I asked one of my students, I was teaching in the Bachelor of Community Management where elders come, not just elders, but adults, come from around the country to get a, a degree to show that they already know what they're doing. <laughs> and there was this elder, she's about 64 at the time, Auntie Mary and Coconut, and I said, I don't know what to do. Like, how am I going to have this class? And she said, oh, just, just let them know that they should go find some place that's beautiful in nature. And, you know, like a beautiful tree. 
and they should sit down, and if they have something that's of concern to their heart, something that they don't know and they want to know, that they should say a prayer, and they should you know, ask the Creator, ask, or their own soul, or the spiritual reality as they see it, but it, with humility to say, I don't know, I need help, and to expect that an answer would come. And, uh, and then to act on that when the answer did come. It's just like a conversation with your grandparents. You know, a lot of us pray and we, we kind of say, I really want this, and then we run out of the room, you know? But if we're in front of our grandparents who have the wisdom and we're actually asking for something, say, you know, I, I really don't know how to do this. Can you show me, right? If we leave the room before they even have a chance to say anything, it's not really a prayer, right? You've got to sit and listen and expect an answer, you know? And then if they give us an answer, we feel like, oh, that's something I didn't know that came to me. Then you act on it. You have to actually put it into practice. That's another part of the prayer. But most of us don't do the full thing. We just say, oh, why aren't you helping me? I keep asking, you're not helping me. And then we run out of the room because <laughs> we're busy. We've got so much to do in our life. So anyway, uh, I started trying to put into practice this, you know, and it's, uh, it's a reflection in my own faith, which I'm not going to talk about my own religion here, but, you know, it has, it has a mirror in my own faith as well, these principles. And um, I just want to share one story where it seems to work when I try to help other people. It doesn't seem to work very well when I try to do it for myself, but they seem to be the same thing eventually, I found out. Helping others helps me. Um, so in 2012, uh, I was working for the Rundry Aboriginal Elders Council in Melbourne, and I was doing well-being and governance training. And we were developing a strategic plan uh, for, their, for their tribal council. And towards the end of that, um, I remember one day a newspaper article came out, and I walked into the office, and there was this newspaper article that was quite um, mean towards the Aboriginal community in one of the main newspapers. And it was saying they just hungry for money and they didn't have, you know, this whole thing about culture and spirit was just a ruse to try to get money and very, you know, uh, mean and unfair. And so you, I could see that, you know, the elders were really, uh, you know, it just, it just weighs you down. And I remember the head of the elders council said, you know, you've got a PhD in law, do you, do you think you could do something? And I said, well, actually, it's not my kind of law. And I, I don't know anybody in Melbourne because I've only just moved here from Sydney, but I'll call a friend and see what I can do. So I called a friend, his name is Sam Altman. He was the coordinator for the Bass Street Community Management. And uh, I said, you know, Sam, there's a situation. Do you know of any lawyers? And uh, mind you, I'd said some prayers before this, you know, asking for help. And he said, well, I've got a friend, you know, and he does that kind of work. Um, libel and that kind of stuff. You can ask him, and uh, if that doesn't work, you can contact the Jewish community. Now, just to go back a step, I did ask that man, and he said, yeah, I'm more than happy to help, and they, they got together and they worked out something, um, and, but that's the side story. He said, if he doesn't work, contact the Jewish community. I was like, contact the Jewish community? What do you mean? And he said, well, they have a long memory. I was like, I don't. <laughs> what, what do you mean they have a long memory? He says, oh, you know, because of William Cooper. And I was like, William Cooper? And he said, yeah. He says, you know, 1938, Kristallnacht. I said, Kristallnacht, I've heard that word before. It's a night of broken glass when the Nazis burnt all the storefronts and the synagogues in Germany. And they rounded up thousands of Jewish people and put them into concentration camps. And at that time, all over the world, the reaction was quite muted, even though this was, a lot of people see this was a key moment at the beginning of the Holocaust in a, in a concerted way. But the reactions were all over the world muted, you know? It's like no government anywhere in the world made any political response. They didn't censure the German government. They didn't remove diplomatic relations. Nobody severed diplomatic relations with Germany at the time. The New York Times wrote that this was an economic move because the German government's coffers were empty and so they wanted to get money from the Jewish people. That's why they were attacking businesses. So it was really misnamed as an act of genocide. 
And that was all over the world. Like, of course, the Jewish community knew. <laughs> but in the non-Jewish world, there was really nothing in response, except for one man. His name was William Cooper. He was an Aboriginal elder, 78 years old, from Australia. And he wrote a letter to the German government saying that this is the beginning of a genocide, and it's a violation of the human rights of our brothers and sisters. Now this is at a time when he was categorized as an animal under the Wildlife Protection Act of Australia. That's how Aboriginal people were managed at the time, in 1938. He was an animal, not a human being. But he's crying out about the human rights because he knows. He knows what genocide looks like. And he then led a march with the Jewish and Aboriginal community, or sorry, the Aboriginal community, just the Aboriginal community, to the German consulate in Melbourne with this letter. And they closed the doors on him, but he shoved it under the door. And he named it for what it was, out of all the people, as an indigenous person. And in Australia, we don't know who this person is. In the white communities, we don't know. In, in Australian National University's uh, biography, which is supposed to be the, you know, the best description of biographies, he's named, but not for that march. They don't mention it. They say he died in vain. They don't even mention what he did. But the Aboriginal community knows, and the Jewish community knows because it was printed in the newspaper that day that there was this march. So that's why he said, talk to the Jewish community. Because if, that, if the Aboriginal community in Melbourne needs help, they'll get it. So I was like, well, how am I going to help? How am I going to contact the Jewish community? Because I don't like, keep a census of what people's faiths are. I might have friends that are Jewish, but I don't know. And uh, said some prayers, and then a week later, Sam writes to me and says, sends me an email with a photograph of a newspaper article that says that the Jewish community in St. Kilda, a suburb of Melbourne, the oldest synagogue there, is going to have a um, jazz festival on Sukkot, one of their holy days, to honor William Cooper's family they hadn't had a chance to before, to honor William Coop's family for his contribution. And that was in one week's time after discovering this whole story. And there were tickets available because they were fundraising for William Cooper's family. So I contacted the organizer and I went. And you know, I was asked to be a security guard at the door. Uh, when I saw the organizer, she said, oh, it's so good to see you. Could you go be a security guard at the front gate? I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> so I went, and I was helping guide people you know, there. And that felt good, because I used to work in Israel uh, as a youth volunteer at the Baha'i World Center. So it felt like, oh, I remember my, young, my younger years. You know, It was really nice. And, uh, and so then I, I went inside, and uh, the rabbi spoke. And, uh, a hundred Russian Jews showed up in a busload as tourists without any connection to the event, I think. And they didn't speak any English. So the synagogue was completely full. And uh, I have some Russian Jewish background on my mother's side. So I was like, ah, oh, my people are here. <laughs> I was really happy. And uh, the rabbi spoke and honored William Cooper for what he had done for the Jewish community. And then um, William Cooper's grandson, Uncle Boydy, got up to speak. And at this point, the 100 Russian Jews <laughs> decided that this was the time they needed to go <laughs> in, the middle of his, <laughs> in the middle of his grandson's time. They didn't know who he was. They didn't even know what was going on. And they just got up and left. And I was like, no, you can't leave. This is the worst. I can't even hear what he's saying. I was just like, oh, this is so anticlimactic to the story. <laughs> and so they left. And only a few days ago, I was down in Hill City uh, with a Lakota friend. And somebody said, oh, you know what? I know why they needed to leave because the next part of the story wouldn't have been able to happen. And I never realized that. So what happened was is that an elder got out his didgeridoo, and he played the didgeridoo in the, in the synagogue. So I'm sure it's the first time a didgeridoo. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's this long, hollow tree log, you know? It's like You know, into the ground. <laughs> and, and afterwards, uh, the rabbi said to the family there, do you have any questions for us, for the Jewish community? He says, oh yeah, do you, do you have anything like the didgeridoo that you guys play? And he's like, oh, well, we have a, a sacred instrument that we only play on Yom Kippur and another day, it's called the, the shofa, 
which is a, uh, a ram's horn. And, uh, and we're very proud of it, actually. It's the largest ram's horn in Australia. It's uh, three feet long. And, uh, and they say, oh, would you go get it? <laughs> and he kind of looks at this congregation, and he goes, oh, and he goes, and he, he goes and brings out this beautiful curved ram's horn, like this long. And, uh, and they say, would you play it? So he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> and he lifts it up, and... To the heavens, this high piercing note lifted upwards towards the heavens. And then somebody says, play together. So they get the didgeridoo, these earth notes going down, and the high notes of the shofar going to the heavens. And I'm sure in the first time in history that those two notes have been played at the same time, these two ancient faiths. I could have died there and said, that was enough for me. <laughs> it was so beautiful. Now, the story doesn't finish there. Uh, there was a, a journalist there who had wanted to interview me, but there, was, there wasn't the time for interviewing me. It was about covering that for her. And uh, we spoke a few days later, and she, we, she interviewed me for about four hours, and we were talking about the spirituality and social transformation class. And she was asking, like, how do you teach that? And you know, I was talking about the importance of honoring our own ancestors, you know, that appreciating our own spiritual heritage is really important. And that when we do that, we learn to step into our own shoes. You know? and, uh, and I said, you know, your own sense of justice, why did you cover this event? What calls you to this? Where in your ancestors has there been an injustice that's given you a sense of compassion? And so she started investigating that for herself. And we talked about the steps of prayerful action, you know, of asking for help and trusting that it will come. And then when it comes, acting on it and being steadfast. These are important parts of that. Anyway, she contacted me sometime later and she said two things. One is that the grandson of William Cooper, see the, the 74th anniversary of that march didn't happen on the Jewish festival. It happened a couple weeks later. And he reenacted it. And he marched with the whole Jewish community and the Aboriginal community to the German embassy with a letter his grandfather wrote that wasn't accepted. And he gave it to the German consul general. And he accepted it. And he apologized. He said, I'll give this to my government. It took 74 years, but the grandson fulfilled the grandfather's wishes. And the other thing was, as she said, I tried to write this story up to give it to the newspapers. My own, I was a freelance journalist, and my organization said they don't have the funding. I was sad. And I went to another mainstream paper, and they said no. And then another one, and they said no. And then, uh, then I approached the Koori Mail, which is the average national Aboriginal newspaper. And I gave the story about what happened with William Cooper's celebration to them. And they said, oh, yes, we'll publish that. And they published it. And the day after they published it, she got a phone call. And the phone call was from another relative of William Cooper. And she said, I only read the Koori Mail. I don't read any other newspaper. And when I saw that story, I realized something. Because my great-grandfather was given something special by the Jewish community before he died. And I'm not sure exactly who gave it or when, but I inherited it. And before I die, she's 74, before I die, I want to return it to the Jewish community to keep that circle of spiritual reciprocity alive, of the connection between our peoples in history. And since that article came out, now I know I can give it back. So it had to be in that paper. So I was actually writing this story up for, for a book. My daughter asked me to write up some of these stories. She said, Dad, if you don't, for seven years, I've had people asking me to write. And finally, in March, my daughter said, Dad, you need to write for us, your kids. So I started writing. And uh, this story I'm writing up, and I want to give it to each person in the story to make sure they're OK with it and that it's accurate. And the part where the other descendant of William Cooper is thinking about returning that gift, kind of art, uh, I wanted to see, does the Jewish community know about this? 
You know, it, it, how did it go? How did that return go? And I found out that it hadn't happened. And so I got, I contacted the journalist, and she gave me the number for this relative. And I contacted, called, and her son answers. And he was in his 40s. And he asked me about my background and a little bit this and that. And he said, well, actually, my grandmother got ill after that ceremony, and she wasn't able to return it. But we're still wanting some help to do that. Would you help us? I said, can you call us back at 4 tomorrow? I said, oh. I call at 4 p.m. And the phone rings and nobody answers. I was like, okay. Ten minutes later, my phone rings, and it's his mom. And we have this long conversation. And she says, yeah, it would be good for that to be returned now. And could you help us? And it would be good for it to go into a Holocaust museum. And I, hung, I said, I'll do whatever I can. I hung up, and I'm like, I don't know any Holocaust museums. I don't have any contacts. I don't know what to do. It's just like the reaction I have when my friend says, contact the Jewish community. Like, I don't know how to do that, you know? So anyway, uh, this is three weeks ago, a little bit over three weeks ago, on May 25th. Uh, my wife and I, we go to see the movie Woman in Gold, starring Helen Mirren and uh, Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> And we're watching this movie, which is a true story about this Austrian woman who uh, her aunt is painted, uh, and this beautiful painting gets stolen by the Nazis. And after the Nazis are defeated, the painting gets returned not to her family, but to the Austrian government, and it goes into the main museum. Sorry to ruin this movie for whoever's listening or watching me. <laughs> but the, the, um, they spent years trying to get this painting back, and they finally did. And uh, she managed to, uh, she chose that I want my aunt to be in the country I'm living in now, in the United States. And they chose which museum it went to, and they managed to get quite a lot of money for it at the same time. And the lawyer, who had been working for free this whole time and lost his job, um, he, he took his share of that money and used quite a bit of it to help establish uh, as we're watching the credits, my wife turns to me and says, look, establish a Holocaust museum in Los Angeles. So on the way to this gathering, I'm going through LA. My wife says, why don't you write to the Holocaust Museum? So I do. First, I contact the, the grandmother and let her know the idea. Is this OK with you? And she says, yeah, go ahead. It's good. So I contacted them, and within three minutes, I got an email back from the director who was in Israel. And she said she was very enthusiastic about the potential of getting together to discuss this. And she CC'd like six people. And I said it was what a blessing that she's in Israel at the time that she received this. And she says, I've never seen a more beautiful day in the Holy Land. And so three hours after I landed here, I went to a meeting in the Holocaust Museum. And I found out that the president of the museum is the same Mr. Schoenberg in the movie that we watched. <laughs> so, yeah, and then uh, we had the meeting and they were like, you know, we understand. Why don't you want to return it to the Jewish Museum in Melbourne? Because that's their story. And that's a good question, but they already have a collection there. And the other thing is, is that my answer, I said, there's a lot of racism in Australia. I haven't met any white people that know the William Cooper story, in spite of him being a Gandhi, in spite of him being a Nelson Mandela, in spite of him being a Martin Luther King for Australia. He's not known. People don't access those spaces to learn about him. And so this needs to be internationalized. This needs to go out into the international community. Because right now, the Australian government is closing down 200 Aboriginal communities as we speak this year. They're defunding 200 communities in Western Australia, the same communities that gave that HIV medicine. They're removing 60% of the federal funding for those communities, and the state government says, well, we can't make up the shortfall, so we'll remove our 40%. So no water, no electricity, no police, no health. And now the police are moving in and saying, well, it's not safe to live here anymore. You have to come into the cities, urban ghettos. Does this sound familiar, 1938? Right now. So this needs to be internationalized, the story. William Cooper spoke of this justice. 
and it's time for reciprocity. So they asked, so uh, you know, why, why not local? Why not in the Melbourne Museum? So I gave them that answer. And then I said, and you know, from the Bible, it says, no prophet is appreciated in their hometown. And as soon as I said that, they both were nodding. So I conduct, contacted the grandmother and said, would you like to, uh, you know, I, I told them that I shouldn't be the one to return it. It shouldn't be me. I should, they should invite the family to come, establish a relationship with the museum, and have that art returned. And so the, the art, the museum said, yeah, it'd probably cost about 7,000 and, you know, we'll talk to the people and see if we can get that done. So I contacted the grandmother and she said, yeah, that would be good. And I said, so it would be your son? The first one I spoke to, she said, no, it would be my daughter that would come with me. Because so, she was the first Aboriginal person to graduate from University of Wollongong. And she did her degree in Native American healing. Yeah. So this story is about, you know, the spiritual healing that comes from justice and the spiritual ill health that comes from injustice. It's not just about plants. It's not just about these other things, but justice and injustice. Colonization is a, was a disease itself. It was, a, it was an injustice in not honoring and respecting and having cultural genocide. Restoration and honoring each other because we're all one family is healing. So that happened on the way here, so I thought that was worth sharing with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Um, you're speaking about the um, indigenous plants for healing and medicine, and and then comparing with the pharmaceuticals, which originally come from them, but the pharmaceuticals are, as you said, synthesized into compounds, and they extract portions that are healing but they don't I extract the entire thing mm -hmm. for balancing in what the plant does. Mm -hmm. um, could you comment on that, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good observation. Um, so, in a variety of the communities that I've spoken to, so for instance, Bhutan, which I mentioned that has um, I think I mentioned it. No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask you to talk about Bhutan. Yeah, so, um, okay, so I had a dream uh, about, um, I was asking a plant for permission to use it as a medicine in my dream. And the plant replied that I have to ask uh, its family. And so then I had to ask other plants, and I had to ask other indigenous communities that use that plant. And the end result of all that asking permission resulted in recognizing a, a regional set of kinship relations between indigenous people in the area. So every tribe that used that plant had a family relationship with that plant. And, and in my dream, that replaced the pharmaceutical companies. You know? And the relationships between young people and elders were restored, and the the, the transmission of knowledge flourished again. And I woke from that dream and I was like, wow, that was really powerful. Now some, a year later or so, I was wanting to apply for a job at a university in um, Townsville, James Cook University, uh, because uh, an elder had asked for my assistance on Palm Island and, I, and there was no way I was going to get paid for it. And if I was going to be able to help, I need a job. So 
hadn't finished my PhD yet, but so I was applying for a job, and then I, I asked a friend, do you know anybody in that town that uh, you know, I might be able to stay with? He said, I've got a friend, his daughter is at university, he's got a room. So I contacted him, and I went to his house, and he had an Italian accent, and I said, so uh, you're from Italy? You were born in Italy? He said, no, no, I was born in Eritrea. And I said, oh, Eritrea, where is that? He said, like, this is North Africa. So the Italians had colonized Eritrea. Most of them left, his family stayed. And I said, so you came from Eritrea to Australia? He said, no, I came from Bhutan. I was like, what were you doing in Bhutan? And then he proceeded to describe pretty much my dream that I had. And I was like, what? So he had spent 10 years. When he arrived there, the traditional healers were very protective of their medicines. And they specialized. And they only shared with like one initiate. And it took years for that person to learn. But they were facing a crisis because the young people weren't interested in a long-term commitment to become a healer that wasn't going to allow them to have economic viability. So there was a crisis of knowledge continuing. And so he became friends in the Royal Bhutanese government, and they asked him if he would assist with this. So he did something similar to what I had described in Samoa, and gathered the healers together in a safe space. And after they consulted, they decided a way to avoid this loss was to start sharing with each other. And they created a traditional medical university. And they created a traditional hospital, all based on their own cultural values but with Western doctors in service to them. Okay, So the Western doctors were in service to them. It wasn't about integration or merging the two. The Western system was in service. So for instance, identifying which collection practices resulted in the, in the best um, sustainable level of, of medicine, you know, and, and being able to, to use science to identify those kinds of things. What elevations in the mountains had, how to develop um, processing plants that were hygienic um, and could develop whole plant-based medicines and develop a distribution network, you know. So they use the whole plant is the point of that story in response to your question, but it gives you some other aspects of something that's possible in the world. And they developed the National Bhutanese Traditional Medical System, and that's now the medical system for Bhutan, and all medicine for Bhutanese people is free. And they have the National Happiness Index as how they measure their health and well-being and economic output. But they use the whole plant. And they say that there's not just the active compound that we identify for the cancer. There's the other compounds and other things that you don't even call compounds in the plant that balance the human system. And that's why they grew that way. We have to use the whole plant. So it balances. You know? And that's one of the reasons for less toxic toxicity in traditional practices, you know, because the Western approach tends to be reductionistic. Let's find what the point is that works and take that out and, and enhance it and make it into a pill and then we cause imbalances in the system because the plant has the other things. And sometimes they combine plants even. So, you know, and I had one, one healer tell me in Canada just last week, he said that, you know, there's guidance that you shouldn't even wash the plant because there's organisms that live on the plant that create a symbiotic relationship for the medicine. So there's some medicines that it's important actually not to wash it. And it's actually backed up. It's interesting, just on a whole side story, I was at a Battle Creek River ceremony in Camrose last week, and one of the guest speakers was a Nobel Prize winner, Peace Prize winner, a co-winner, uh, Russell, I've forgotten his last name. Sorry about that, mate. Anyway, uh, he was sharing how he was studying how hail forms. And as a young man, he came up with this idea that there must be, the plants must have some kind of, they must cause the rain. And so he, he conjectured that there were organisms, bacteria, something that grows on the plants. And, uh, and he, he put forward this hypothesis, and he was kind of laughed at, and they tested it, and it didn't work. And he put it in a bag and put it away, and then about two weeks later, tested it again, and it had these powerful ice-forming nucleotides in the bag that had these plants. The bacteria had, had time to produce it. And so he, he won you know, Nobel Prize, but he discovered that plants do indeed cause rain. 
and that the wind and the insects carry it slowly, slowly up, you know. So it's really important to have our forest, to have our plants, you know. And it's another, another aspect of whole plant-based medicine. Plants are the medicine for our rain. Another question. What do you know of uh, digitalis? It's used to regulate the heartbeat because I, I was on it for a number of years ago being a heart patient. Mm -hmm. um, do you, where was it developed? Um, who, who discovered it? And, uh, how widely is it still used and all that? Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks. Uh, I know that's foxglove, um, but maybe somebody else can answer it. I actually haven't followed that story up. Um, it wasn't, wasn't one of the ones that I followed. Does somebody else know the answer to that question? I'll look it up. I appreciate your bringing it to my attention. Um, yeah. I have a question. Yeah, sure. So is your, where, where, uh, where is your home? How do you think of your home? Because uh, you mentioned the beginning from being raised in New York or New Jersey, mm -hmm. and then um, in Australia, and also you're very, you know, um, you've been all over the world, I imagine, mm -hmm. um, meeting all sorts of people and cultures and other things. So how, how do you look at yourself on the planet? Uh -huh. uh, wow, there's the... There's the mystical level, <laughs> and then there's the, I live in Melbourne, that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, I currently live in Melbourne, Australia, and I've been there for about three years now. Um, and um, yeah, my wife and I have been talking, like, we're not sure if there's a transition coming up, or um, I have invitations to live in other places, and um, Is yeah. Is Sorry? Um, well, I mean, to be honest, I try, a lot of the time I'm just trying to be obedient to uh, invitations to do things. And sometimes there's a pause in the feeling of this is where I'm supposed to be, and I'm not sure what's supposed to happen next, and then something else will happen. Um, so I'm kind of in that point, actually, right now, where, um, you know, there's some good things happening there, and my wife is... Uh, doing some really wonderful community work. And uh, she, she's Canadian, but she just finally got her permanent residency. So it would be kind of ironic for her to f just get her permanent residency and all of a sudden we go. <laughs> um, but she's doing work that she really cherishes, but it is the kind of work she could do anywhere, I think. But um, I don't know, it's something to, to see what happens. I just have to. It's okay. You gotta get the mic. Put it on the record, please. No, I was just, I was just, it's about place. Um, Alaska. A lot of people here find Alaska like is um, either they were raised here, they born here. Um, they have a very close relationship to it, as you would, I think, any any place with the, you know traditions. But other people who come here, some people really are tied to this place, and other people are coming and going. And it's it's just this. In Alaska, place comes up in different ways, and I was just mm -hmm. wondering personally how you dealt with place. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, how I deal with place is a different question than I thought. Okay. Um, well, I, I guess I try to be, uh, in my prayers, I try to say, I don't know this place if I'm new there. And I say, uh, you know, I'm ignorant. And I ask for assistant, assistance from the ancestors of the land that I'm in at that time and say, you know, permission to be here and if I can be of service, and I need guidance. And, um, and then I trust that my own ancestors and the ancestors of the land will have some kind of exchange and that I'll be in a better position to learn um, because of that prayerfulness um, and an openness to receive wisdom about that place because each place is completely different. So I have to assume that I'm like a child every time I go to a new place. Hi. Yes, would you like to say? Okay, can somebody? Can you just repeat this question? Okay. Uh, 
You have to kind of come up, I think. Oh, okay. Um, so before I get to my question, I'd like to say I'm an Alaska Native student. I'm, uh, I'm a researcher, I'm a biochemist, I'm a teacher, so I have to wear a lot of different hats and use a lot of different languages depending on who I'm talking to. And you've talked repeatedly about this conversation that needs to happen between indigenous communities and between scientists. And I keep trying to think of what that would look like or what advice you would have to somebody that's speaking to the scientific community because scientists are often so uh, narrow-minded and short-sighted. And you know, they don't want to know how your day is or how you're feeling or anything. They just want to know, does something work? And how do I use it? So I'd just like to know if you have any sort of input on what, how to make this conversation happen, what the conversation looks like, and what advice do you have to give to a scientist about how to, how to conduct this kind of research ethically and responsibly? Yeah, hey, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think um, one of my own lessons has been that I used to think of uh, an us-them thing a lot. Um, I, I used to have a lot more prejudice towards the, the Western, because I was trying to own my own arrogance, and so I was projecting my arrogance on other people who don't necessarily have arrogance sometimes. <laughs> and um, I've met a lot of humble scientists. In fact, the, the greatest scientists are the ones uh, that, that, that acknowledge the importance of intellectual humility, the intellectual humility and elegance of design as, as uh, determinants of, of good research. You know, and there, there are they are out there, um, and uh, but but you know b besides the just being careful in our thinking of automatically pushing away others because they sense that because it's a sense it's a sense of subconscious superiority, and people will pick up on it even if our words don't say it. If we have a sense of subconscious superiority to the other person, they're going to feel it. They're not going to really be interested in a conversation. Or if they are, they're going to be protective about what's most important to them or being vulnerable. So dealing with our own, you know, our own stuff first as a step in the conversation is the, is the place to start for me. Now, when I was in Africa, South Africa in uh, March, uh, I was asked to help facilitate a conversation between 30 research, research groups between uh, 30 research groups of scientists and indigenous community members uh, from 17 universities. Um, and, uh, you know, I wasn't sure what I was going to say because this is Africa and I don't really, I haven't spent time there much. You know, I was there in November. Um, and then they said, you're going you're gonna to talk on the second day and set the tone for the second day. Two days beforehand, they gave me this knowledge. I was like, oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> well, at least I get the first day to listen. You know, I can listen and maybe just thank them for the wisdom that I heard, right? You know, and just kind of echo it back in a way that might be helpful for the second day. But then I, I heard the night before the organizer saying to one of the other professors saying, you know, you have to wear a suit because the minister is coming from the government. I didn't have a suit. <laughs> and she said, you're going to wear your suit? And I was like, uh-huh. And I didn't have a suit. <laughs> and so that morning I went... I went to the hotel staff and I was like, help. <laughs> so they organized a, a hotel suit, <laughs> one of the staff suits for me. <laughs> and the tie said the name of the hotel on it. And I was like, oh, I, don't, I can't do that. And they said she went and got her brother to bring a tie from their house. They were so loving. Anyway, so I'm ironing my suit. They said, be there at 9.30. I'm ironing my suit. And, uh, you know, and the uh, phone rings uh, with like 10 minutes to go. And I'm like, I answer the phone, and she goes, this organizer is looking for you. Where are you? I said, oh, I said 9.30. It's like, I'm early. I said, no, 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 you're supposed to be here now. And I was like, okay, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. And I was just starting to turn off the iron, and then the phone rings again, like 40 seconds. And it's the organizer, and she goes, where are you? And I said, I'm coming. <laughs> so I go down, put in my suit, I go downstairs, and turns out that uh, the keynote had pulled out from the, after the minister speaking, and she wants me to speak now. And I'm like, ha, I had nothing prepared. I'm like, I don't know what I'm gonna say. And so I just got up and 
you know, and all I could speak to, and this is in reference to, you know, I was thinking about all the scientists in the room and what can I say. And so there's a couple of things. One is within science, intellectual humility is really important because we can't learn something unless we acknowledge we don't know yet, right? That's really important. And we, we're aware there's different paradigms of thought. We're aware that Einstein said that no problem can be solved by the same level of consciousness that created it. So if, if, if a certain scientific paradigm has created certain kinds of problems in society, that's not the paradigm to solve it. So it becomes really vital to learn how to practice intellectual humility with other cultures like traditional healers and to ask, what is your paradigm? And to give it the benefit of the doubt, even if it doesn't make sense, to allow it to be tested within its own framework, not the other framework, and then to see how that flows. But it takes a long time to learn that, those cultural assumptions. You don't just learn a scientific paradigm overnight, and you don't learn a, a traditional healing framework overnight. It takes a long set of relationship building and conversations. But you have to start with humility, or else you'll never get to that stage of exploring and learning. So now the other thing that I shared was there's an excellence to indigenous knowledge. There's a, a high level of, of excellence and integrity that is beyond Western science. And this is in a few ways. So one is, for instance, in Maori culture and other indigenous communities, they know generations upon generations of their ancestry and they have songs where they sing the genealogy. I know one guy who knows up to 40 generations, you know? And he knows contributions that each generation made. And when you have that kind of long-term research, where you're observing climatic data, and you're observing when there is a shift that sometimes has involved human behavior in the stories Man did this wrong thing, and then this happened in nature, and we lost this, right? Those are those stories are. Those are long-term observations that have the wisdom of similar environmental crises that we had in the past, and that we can actually look at and say, how do we learn from them now, right? That kind of long-term, we don't have scientific research that goes much past three years these days, because each government you know, wants to fund it for a little while, and they change the agenda, new government comes and says, oh, we're not funding that kind of outcomes anymore. So you don't have the capacity for intergenerational scientific research as you do in indigenous communities. That's a very superior form of science. On another level, one of the things that we learned at the Wisdom Engaged Wellbeing in Northern Communities Conference in February, so there was a Navajo medicine man there who shared that in their tradition, in order to be considered an ordained healer. You have to have had the disease, the illness. You have to have had the illness, then been guided to what the cure is and healed yourself before you can even speak about that illness or the cure to anyone. So you have to actually have been sick with it. That's a really high level of specialization and integrity as a doctor. Instead of having a cyclopedia and saying all rattling off all these different cures that you actually don't really know anything about in a deep level, or the illnesses because you haven't had any of them, you don't know what it feels like, so you can't have compassion with your patient in the same way that you could if you've had that disease and you've been guided to the cure. Can you imagine that kind of integrity as a doctor? We couldn't do it in Western health. There's no way. Our system would collapse if we demanded that level of integrity but it's possible in other cultures because they have certain values that allow it. So there are all kinds of ways to acknowledge the superior, well, you know what, I don't want to say superiority, but each culture has custodianship over aspects of knowledge that give it excellence in that, in that way. And so in those ways, indigenous knowledge is far superior to Western science. And it, and it demands humility from, from scientists. Hi. Sure. Um. You've been talking about reciprocity, and 
And I was thinking as you're talking that the indigenous people have a relation to keeping the plants alive and to the whole environment and that the plants might have a different effect on them than people coming from another area. And we might have we might have a very, many of our diseases may be caused because we're eating plants imported and we have really no reciprocity with these plants either. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you have thought that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, uh, I mean, one of the things that I noticed here in Alaska the first time that I was here, or maybe the second time, uh, I was down in Ketchikan and um, I was noticing how dependent uh, the community seemed to be on imported foods, you know? And I said, wow, this is a major issue. And at the same time, I was speaking with traditional healers and gatherers, and they were very hesitant to be able to access their own traditional foods, you know, in ways that could sustain the community. And at the same time, you had young people facing malnutrition you know, in, in certain communities that I knew of. And so there's an issue with, you know, it sounds, it sounds like there's people in this room working on this, um, but from what I'd seen, there, there's an issue with honoring the local foods and medicines, which is what the gathering here is all about this weekend, you know. It's about honoring the local foods and, and, and medicines. And really, the best way to protect something is to use it, you know, is, is to honor it by, by having those plants and those local uh, sources of food. Um, you know, and um, certainly if we had, um, you know, some kind of temporary crisis, whether through oil collapsing or, you know, something that interrupted travel for a while, you can imagine, it would be disastrous for Alaska because of the dependency. And so right there, it just doesn't take much expertise or wisdom to figure out that it really makes a lot of sense to become a lot more familiar with the local environment and to honor that local environment in a lot more than maybe is in some places because we're really dependent on it, actually. We just don't know it because there's an illusion that we have our food from other places. That's completely an illusion. You know, that that food that comes from other places is what sustains us. It's the local, the land, you know, here. So, I mean, it's not answering all of your question, but, um, you know, the practicing gratitude locally, starting locally, is really important. Uh, I think she had a question. Sorry. I can answer them really quick. Uh, okay. <laughs> I want to do long stories for each one. Actually, I have comments instead of questions. Oh, okay. An American Indian friend of ours said, Western medicine tries to bring you as close as they can to how you were before you got sick, mm -hmm. whereas traditional medicine makes you better than you were before you got sick. Mm. And then my other comment is that uh, some of us here have worked with Alaska Native and American healers uh, who taught us that to collect plant medicines, you have to know the sacred way to do it, how to collect it, what part of the plant to use, what to use it for, when it expires, and what to do with it when it expires. And because of those teachings, I've always thought that maybe when medicine makes you sick or doesn't work right, because some or none of that protocol was followed. Uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving us information on your background. Also, I would like to know about the Aborigines. You mentioned that they are, are basically right at this moment getting put or how can I put it, they are, have to leave their homes. So do you know if they're where, whereabouts of where they could go to basically live in just a standard lifestyle? Because you mentioned lights are getting cut off, water is getting cut off. Mm -hmm. Repeat the question. I think, I think he'll address it when he yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah. Um, so the question was in relation to currently in Australia, the Aboriginal communities that I mentioned, uh, more than 200 of them that are being currently uh, closed down in Western Australia, do they have a place to go to maintain their standard of life? And uh, well, I mean, the thing is, is that, I mean, that's their, their homes, right? That's, you know, um, this is the places that they're connected to. And, um, you know, if you move from a land that you're familiar with to one that you're not, then it's, you know, it's not home anymore. And uh, they, there was a group that tried to go to an island off of Western Australia and the police moved in and forced them off that island. And, you know, so I don't know what the ultimate objective of the government is in this case. It sounds like they're wanting them to become, you know, into urban collectives in the cities, which is really totally, you know, it's, it, it's going to be so, uh, I mean, there's a, an Aboriginal elder who just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I won't say his first name, but the way you say a person's first name there is, if they passed away, is Kumanjay. Uh, Kumanjay Randall. And he's the, I guess you could say, custodian of Uluru, or in, in the Western language, Ayers Rock, the big red rock, the mountain in the middle of Australia. And he made a documentary, which I'd encourage you to see, called Kanini, K-A-N-Y-I-N-I, -I -I, Kanini. And it's a, it's a beautiful documentary that explores the four types of connection. Uh, connection to family, connection to land, uh, connection to spirituality, and connection to law, or lore, or religion. And how these were each severed by colonization. And it's how the severing of those relationships with family, with, with land, with spirituality, and the language around that. Uh, and the lore led to the illness, right, in people. And it's restoring those which will bring about the health. So anytime we do anything, we have to ask ourselves, is this restoring the connection or is it weakening or severing it? And in any action we engage in with others. So, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's the point, because then you can monetize relationships. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's probably the agenda is actually they want to extract mine, more mining, because there's a mining boom in that state, and they want the land for that. So they have to get the people off the land. Yeah, they need to get off the land. That's the government's goal, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, last um, okay. Martha. <coughs> When I was born in 1958, the American government had a program of relocation, and the only reason we didn't move to Chicago, I believe, is because I got pneumonia when I was um, about a month old. And my mom asked my dad, what happens if we, both of them grew up in rural Alaska, and my mom asked my dad, what would happen if we got sick there? Where would we go? Uh, who would help us? And my dad thought long and hard about that and decided that he would not move our family to, uh, to an outside city in order to make us more American, more Western. So um, when, I listened, when I first came here, I was wondering about your background. I didn't know if you're a man or a woman because Chris can be a, a Christine or a Christopher. I didn't know where you're from because I just saw the little blurb in the paper, which I'm thankful Rachel uh, put in. And I, uh, and I wondered about, um, just wondered about your, uh, who are you? But the topic is what caught my attention. And when I was sitting there, I thought, I wonder about your background, where did you get this gift? And you answered it in part, I think by saying that your mom was Russian, Jewish, Jewish Russian. And I wondered then, did she have some, kind, was she, she must have been, had her family impacted by the Holocaust. And I think sometimes with, and I wondered two things is, do you think it's in your DNA, uh, what you have, your gift? And also in all your travels, you're bringing up places, Africa, um, Australia, the US, and you're talking about issues like um, circles. I know at the Native Hospital, they have healing circles that they've gotten going. You've mentioned sharing circles. And I think the young man who was here, I hope he didn't leave, but. Maybe Rachel will know who he is. And I'm just, it heartens me that he is 
here at the university where there is a real void of the very work you're doing and a real disdain for uh, the indigenous peoples here and our knowledge. So could you share with the people here, where is Alaska in the big cosmos? Uh, where are our, what, what are our strengths? What are you seeing happening in the indigenous communities? And also, I would like you to see that young man in the back who has some knowledge of herring. He, I think he has innate knowledge that hasn't, he hasn't tapped into or he hasn't been taught. And then if you could hook him up with the other young man who had been sitting here, the biochemist who's looking for connections. So for me, if the young people on those levels would get together, then you could start working within the university, within the, with the indigenous community. Mm -hmm. So where are we in the big picture in Alaska? And mm -hmm. is it in your DNA? <laughs> <laughs> Two very simple questions. <laughs> yeah, three minutes. OK. Uh, I don't know, and <laughs> no. Um, I, uh, I, I don't know for sure. I do know that, um, that there's a spiritual kind of DNA as well. And I think that it's very important that our, our ancestry, like even if uh, I, my family had committed injustice, you know, that I have the opportunity to, to pray for, for my ancestors' forgiveness and then in my own life be a source of, of healing for that, even if it was an injustice, you know, that my own family committed. And that's maybe DNA, in the, but I think it's, there's definitely some kind of spiritual DNA in that sense, you know, because, uh, for me, it's really important to pray to, to my ancestors to um, address that because uh, of my own ignorance about my, inher my heritage, you know. Um, and I think there's another thing, though, that when you go to a new place, sometimes if you do things, make sacrifices for others, um, their ancestors notice and they start to kind of um, walk alongside and, and, and assist if you're doing it in a good way and you're making sacrifices for their people then there's kind of an adoption process that you can't assume any entitlement. But if you continue to walk with humility in that path, then, then there's kind of a, a, a wider family that, that, that you can be part of, you know? Um, and I've noticed that, like, my ancestors wouldn't know anything about what I've just experienced. So there must be somebody very loving that's, that's helped me that I didn't necessarily deserve, that didn't actually come from my family, but maybe made friends with my family, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, and I forgot the other, oh, Alaska. yeah, Alaska is a place of first light. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it with that. Uh, I, I, I guess we have to um, say goodbye. Okay. <laughs> and thank you very much for coming. Um,